So hello everyone, I'm Russell Wong of Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond. Welcome Come. to our third uh, seminar on central banking and digital currency. So together with our co-organizer and panelist you see on the screen, you see on the screen. I want to thank everyone for joining us again today. Today our host is IMF, So, and I will turn over the microphone to our moderator today, Tommaso Machini Guifoli. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to take part in this seminar. Um, today we have a paper by Dirk Niepeld, Monetary Policy with Reserves and CBDC, Optimality, Equivalence and Politics. So Dirk will present the paper for 25 minutes without interruptions. And David Andorfato, from uh, the Fed uh, uh, system as well, will um, give a discussion for 10 minutes. And then we'll open it up for uh, Q&A. So you're very welcome to post questions in the chat. I'll monitor the chat and ask the questions for you. Uh, we have an hour altogether. We may spill over a little bit uh, past uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time. Um, uh, but not so much. So, Dirk, the floor is yours for uh, 25 minutes, your presentation. Tommaso, thank you very much. And thank you very much to all the organizers and to David, my discussant already now, for putting that on the program. And let me talk a little bit about um, CBDC from a, a macroeconomic perspective. So when I say from a macroeconomic perspective, what I really mean is um, that it's not going to be a paper about CBDC properly, narrowly, right? Because from a macro perspective, I guess what this is really about is the discussion between or the distinction between publicly provided money and privately provided money. And that's what this is really going to be about. Um, so a comparison about of two monetary systems, on the one hand, the two-tiered system that we live in, uh, we bank with banks and the banks amongst themselves um, through a reserve uh, funnel system. And on the other hand, um, the, the new sort of alternative, or you might say the very old alternative that we had in the past, where we all might have an account at the central bank, reserves for all. So that's the comparison I'm interested in. And again, from the macroeconomic perspective, I want to talk a bit or understand a bit better the normative consequences, um, the equivalence uh, consequences or the equivalence properties of these two monetary systems and a little bit political economy implications. Um, so what I'm, what I'm kind of asking here or trying to ask is on the one hand, if you have a choice, what monetary system would you like to live in? Uh, once you tell me which system I should look at, what is the optimal monetary policy within such a system? What are the effects of going from where we are now in a two-tiered system to a mixed system? What happens if you introduce CBDC into a two-tiered system? Is it a game changer or not that much? Uh, that as a byproduct will also have some, um, give us some information about um, what the implicit bank subsidies, you might call it, or the funding cost reductions in the current system for commercial banks are due to their ability to issue deposits. And then I'll have um, a question about, you know, what kind of political forces might um, foster or not um, the support for CBDC. The framework is going to be a super standard macro framework. So I'm going to start from Sidrowski, or you might say from the neoclassical growth model or the RBC model with some role for money, which is not going to be micro founded. Um, and I'll introduce into that banks uh, that um, issue deposits and there's going to be a central bank that issues reserves and possibly also CBDC. The banks have some market power on the market for deposits um, and they invest in capital. Think of that as loans, which eventually end funding capital and or into reserves. Uh, why would they invest in reserves? Because there's some benefit for banks of having reserves. So this is not, again, not going to be micro-founded. I will not have a, a model a la uh, Bianchi Biggio or, or uh, Paolo and others who have thought more carefully about reserves. Uh, this is going to be introduced in a very ad hoc fashion. The central bank here is going to issue reserves and possibly CBDC, as I said, and it might also um, subsidize or tax deposits as a second instrument in order to um, um, you know, address the, the competition problem in the market for deposits. 
and I allow the payment system to require some resources. Now, there's a huge literature, obviously, about the two-tiered system, about reserves. Um, more recently, in particular, there's these papers here, um, which, which think carefully about reserves. I just mentioned that I'm not going to do that. And there's an exploding literature in the recent years about a retail CBDC, although, you know, Tobin already thought about that, but more recently people have thought extensively about that. And there's uh, literature about equivalence. And obviously all the organizers and many people my discussant have all contributed very strongly to that literature. So let me jump to the model since time is very limited. Um, again, as I said, this is a, uh, basically the neoclassical uh, growth model or the RBC model plus some role for the different types of, of money in that economy. So on the household side, there is um, the household cares for consumption, cares for leisure, cares for real balances, money and utility functions, Sidrowski. Um, and real balances are a composite of the money that the central bank, the government issues, I call this M, think of that as CBDC, and the money that the commercial banking system issues, uh, deposits N. And uh, they might not be equally useful in terms of their liquidity properties. Maybe they are, maybe they are not. And this lambda weight might also be endogenous um, to some extent. So it might be a function of how much M you hold relative to the N. Uh, for the talk, I will have this as an exogenous process, the lambda. And these households can basically invest either in capital or in public money or in uh, deposits, depending on which world we live in. And they have some return on their capital, all in real terms, and return on their uh, M and N holdings. They have some labor income. They collect profits because they own the banks in the system and the banks will be profitable. They have consumption outlays and they might pay taxes to the government. So all of this is super standard. You know it by heart. There's a couple of Euler equations or money demand equations that come out of that. And essentially what we need from those Euler equations is that the spread on the different types of assets, for example, this year would be the spread on CBDC on, on publicly provided money. So the, the spread between the risk-free illiquid rate and the rate on M, this will reflect the liquidity benefits that this particular asset um, provides to the households. The banks are non-competitive. They issue deposits and they invest in uh, capital. Uh, again, think of that as loans, which eventually end funding capital and or in uh, central bank reserves. Um, let me first look at the return on the bank's portfolio. So these guys um, issue deposits at time T, which uh, mature at time T plus one, and they have to pay some return to the depositors. The bank has to pay some return to the depositors. They invest in reserves, part of their assets, which have some return RR, and whatever they don't invest in reserves, they invest in capital, which carries the return RK. So that's the return on the portfolio. Uh, in the first period, when they issue deposits, they have some costs, some operating costs from doing so. Because I think of the bank as, be, as being basically a monopsonist on the island where they serve their particular constituency in the, of households. And um, when the households make payments to some other households in the economy, the banks have to or might have to make transfers to other banks on other islands uh, for other households on other, ho on other islands. And these transfers, basically these making payments, um, could potentially be costly for the bank. This cost is new. So that is the unit cost uh, proportional to uh, the amount of deposits that you as an individual bank have, has, has issued. And that is a decreasing function of SEDA. SEDA is the ratio of reserves of that bank relative to the deposits of that bank. Here, the idea is something that uh, you know, Bianchi Biggi would formalize much more carefully when they solve the problem of an individual bank. If you have more reserves, um, that somehow reduces your operating cost. There's less risk of a bank run of having to liquidate your assets, et cetera, et cetera, fire sales, all this kind of stuff. And because there's some externalities involved, there's also a dependence on this bank's operating cost on the reserves to deposits ratio of all the other banks in the system. So SEDA and SEDA bar. And since this is a monopsonistic bank, they realize that if they issue more deposits, the deposit rate in equilibrium will respond. So that's um, the market power that they take into account. 
Now the optimality conditions here are also standard. This is essentially Monte Klein. If you think about issuing a bit more deposits, well, on the plus side, you earn the spread. So the return on capital net of the return on deposits, then you have to bear those operating, oh, sorry, I forgot the theta is the tax or the subsidy that the government might levy or impose on deposits. Then you have these operating costs on the unit of deposits. By issuing more deposits, you drive that up because you implicitly affect the ratio of reserves to deposits. And all of this net benefit of um, issuing more uh, deposits, you have to weigh with the fact that you push up the cost on the inframarginal units of deposits, which is this year. That's the endogeneity of the price that the bank internalizes. That depends on the elasticity of, um, of the quantity of deposits in equilibrium, how it responds to the interest rate. So that's the, the decision about the quantity of deposits. And the second condition is the one that tells you what is the optimal ratio between reserves and capital on the asset side? If you expand reserves, you lose the spread on reserves because they pay a lower interest rate than capital. But what you gain is that you reduce your operating costs and you internalize your internal part of that cost from um, having more reserves. The rest is super, super standard neoclassical. So the firms are just combining capital and labor to produce stuff. The government um, exposed to capital potentially, liabilities are CBDC and reserves, some tax collections. And the resource constraint is also the one that you know from the neoclassical growth model, except that there's so you have output, you have capital net of depreciation, you have consumption outlays. And then here are the resource costs that are arising because in principle, I allow for payments to be costly. So if the central bank issues public money M, there might be resource costs attached to that, which is the mu. If the deposits have some resource costs mu that I just described, then you would have those. They are a function of the reserve to deposit ratio. And reserves issued by the central bank might also um, come with some resource costs row. You can solve this. You can reduce this system essentially to the three equations of the neoclassical growth model. Um, plus wedges and each of the three equations, you can easily figure out how the allocation responds to the policy instruments, both in the CBDC world and in the banking world. You can analyze how the spreads um, feed through the system, but that's not going to be the focus of today because I want to move to the normative and the equivalence and the political economy implications. So what, is, what about optimality? How would a social planner behave in that world? The social planner maximizes utility subject to the resource constraint, spits out the usual first order conditions. And when it comes to the means of payment, they are obviously versions of the Friedman equation. So what is a Friedman rule? What is a bit different here from Friedman is that Friedman would have told us you should satiate the economy with liquidity. Here, that's a little bit different because of these resource costs. So what the optimal thing here is that you should um, uh, make the marginal utility of liquidity proportional to whatever the resource costs in the economy are. And they are a bang bang thing. If uh, the two tiered system is cheaper, then you wanna go two tiered only. If the CBDC one tiered system is cheaper, you wanna go um, one tiered only. So if, you, if, the, if subject to the optimal reserve to deposit ratio, the operating cost of a bank and what it needs in the background on the central bank side is cheaper, than what it costs to provide liquidity through CBDC, then you want to go the banks and otherwise you want to go um, uh, CBDC. Now this corner solution, this bang bang is, uh, is an artifact of what I'm assuming here that real balances are a weighted average of M and N. You know, if that were a non-linear relationship between the two, then you would go to some interior um, optimum and you would have a cost minimizing combination of these two means of payment. The second first order condition tells you what the planner would do as far as reserves is concerned. If the planner says, I wanna live in a CBDC world, sorry, in a world without CBDC with banks, with deposits, then the planner also wants to have reserves. And this condition says that the social cost of providing reserves, again, the resource costs should balance exactly how much this reduces the operating costs of the banks that provide uh, this means of payment. And crucially, of course, now the planner looks both of the interior cost reduction for an individual bank, but also on the externality that comes through the second argument in the cost function. 
Now, more interestingly, what would the government actually do or a central bank here? We don't live in a world of central planners. Can a government or a central bank actually implement the first best? And the answer is subject to the assumptions I made, yes. If the social planner were to go for CBDC, then that's very easy to implement. You simply issue CBDC as a government and you charge a spread on your reserves, which equals the social cost of providing that, which is the resource costs. By doing that, you would automatically price banks out of the market. They wouldn't have a chance to also um, offer deposits. Nobody would be willing to hold them or banks would make uh, losses. So the banks are out in that world. If you decide to live in a two-tiered uh, system, if that is the more efficient thing to do, then again, the government can actually implement the first best. And uh, how they would do it is the following. They would first say, you know, uh, I know what the, what the social planners preferred reserves to deposits ratio SEDA star is. I also know that banks are sort of not internalizing the externality. So I know that their first order condition is this one, which means that I shouldn't charge for my reserves the social cost, the social resource costs of providing reserves, but I should actually subsidize reserves. I should pay a higher interest rate on reserves in order to make it attractive for banks to hold more reserves and thereby implicitly internalizing this externality. So that pins down the, the optimal spread on reserves that the central bank should implement. And then we have one more distortion in the system because banks are non-competitive. So now you might think, well, probably you want to subsidize deposits in that case because you want to make banks to, to, to issue more deposits. And the answer is can be, but need not be. Because by implicitly subsidizing reserves, by paying this high interest on reserves, you already give also an incentive for the bank to lengthen the balance sheet to issue more deposits. And that alone can already correct for the market, um, for the market power friction in the system. So it really depends on the one hand on the, um, on the market power, let me call it the market power friction, which is reflected in the elasticity here on the one hand. And on the other hand, on the externality that reserves provide in the banking sector, depends on the size of these two distortions, if you want, whether the optimal theta is going to be a tax or a subsidy on deposits in, under the optimal policy. Let me move on to equivalence. Um, the question here is, suppose we start in the two-tiered system today and we introduce a bit of M, a bit of CBDC. Is this a game changer or can we expect nothing much to change on the macroeconomic level? And the argument is going to be that under one condition, which I'm talking about in a second, um, the central bank can always make sure in that, in that economy here that nothing changes. Nothing meaning the allocation is unaffected it as well as the price system. What is the condition? The condition is very, very basic. It simply says that whatever equilibrium you start out with in the two-tiered system, this is the cost that it, that it requires to provide a unit of liquidity to the households, both from banks and from the central bank in the background. If it happens to be the case that the cost of providing liquidity through the central bank is the same, then you can get equivalence if the central bank behaves in the right way. And the argument to get that here, the, the logic of that is much, much broader than uh, that particular model. So you need obviously some assumptions and we can, I'm very happy to talk about them later on, but um, uh, the result extends by far uh, above the, the limits of that particular model. So what is the argument really? Um, the substitution of M of CBDC for deposits affects balance sheets in equilibrium and in, in rather complicated ways, some of them but not the allocation and the price system when the central bank simply refinances the banks. That's, that's basically what has to happen. So if there, is, if there is Citibank and they're losing one deposit to the Fed, then Citibank might also shed part of its reserve holdings because it doesn't need as many reserves anymore. That means it, it's, net, it, its net funding uh, is reduced by that one unit of deposits times one minus SEDA, the reserves to deposits ratio. And the central bank simply needs to refinance that amount to city. Now the Fed itself has exactly gained that amount of net funding. They have lost SEDA times one unit in reserves funding, but they have gained one unit in CBDC funding. So exactly the net funding that the Fed gains, they can re-channel into the banking sector. The big question though is, of course, what interest rate to charge on that? 
And the second equation tells you what interest rate the Fed would have to charge Citi in order to make the choice set of, of Citibank being unchanged relative to the situation before. Uh, that's, that's very intuitive. If you think about how much did it cost Citi before to fund its investment in capital, well, it issued one unit of deposit. That was the cost on that. It also had this resource cost to bear. And then SEDA, SEDA of that, it invested in reserves. So the one minus SEDA units left from here, the Citibank could invest in capital. And now in the new world, with this one unit change in funding, uh, the central bank should basically charge this interest rate RL on this one minus SEDA units of loan that the central bank extends to the bank sector. And then the, the, the choice set for the bank would be the same under some additional assumptions, the central bank would essentially have to provide that funding not totally inelastically, sorry, not totally elastically, but it would basically have to replicate the schedule with which the household sector was funding the commercial banking sector before. Note that in that economy, there's no socialism in the sense that now the Fed is extending credit to the real sector. The Fed is refinancing the bank, but all the real capital is still on the balance sheet of the commercial bank. So there's no loans extended to the real economy by the Fed, but it's still being done by a city. Now, what does this imply for funding costs of banks? You, what, we, what we see here, if you buy into that, is that the status quo, the two-tiered system, is essentially equivalent to a world in which we replace deposits by CBDC and the Fed refinancing bank, refinances banks at that particular interest rate RL that I showed you on the previous slide. Now you might say, why should the Fed in that case refinance the banks at RL at that particular interest rate? I mean, why not simply refinance them at the illiquid risk-free interest rate, right? After all, these loan, this loan funding of the bank is no longer in any sense liquidity being used by the household sector. And therefore you can compute essentially what the funding cost reduction of city in that example is, um, or how much would the funding cost for city increase if it had to pay RF, the risk-free interest rate, rather than the low, this equivalent loan rate, this, this hypothetical synthesized equivalent loan rate I showed you on the previous slide. You take this spread, you multiply it by the effective funding that commercial banks in the present system collect by issuing deposits, you divide it by GDP, and that's what I call funding cost reduction, and I compute this for the US. So these are the interest rates I'm using, all in real terms and all gross. The road the, from 99 to today, the red line is uh, the risk-free interest rates, my measure of illiquid rate from Pablo Corlot. The green one is the deposit rate, and the blue one is the um, uh, interest rate on reserves. And this is um, the reserves to deposits ratio, basically up to the financial crisis, the banks hold essentially no reserves and then they increase them to something between 20 and 40% of their deposit, um, their deposits. Now this is what comes out if you use this formula for the equivalent central bank gross loan interest rate, basically something that goes from one and a half percent to today minus 1%. Here it follows basically the deposit rate then it increases at the time when banks started to hold more reserves because at that time the interest rate on reserves was lower than the interest rate on deposits that made it more expensive in some sense to get funding for the banks. More recently, this trend has fallen again. And this is what comes out for the funding cost reduction as a share of GDP, which is something between in the beginning half a percent of GDP then goes up to say between half and 0.8% after the financial crisis turns out to be negative because here we have this strong interest rate compression. Basically funding for banks is not cheaper than if they had simply gotten a loan at the risk-free interest rate. But on top of that, they had these operating costs for running the deposit business. So basically it was a negative or a loss-making business for banks to have this deposit business on their, on their neck. And right now, uh, during COVID, basically the story is repeating, as it looks like here. There's different ways in the paper that I discuss. Uh, different Eric, you have three minutes. Thank you, Tomaso. Three minutes different, left. Different ways of computing that. Um, I showed you one. There's another one in the paper where I rely a bit more on the model's equation. And what comes out if you sort of look at these different, um, different computations is that basically you have this funding cost reduction between say half a percent of GDP prior to the financial crisis, then this disappears and even turns negative 
And right now the pattern is sort of repeating itself. If you look at NEPA data, um, the, the, the contribution of financial sector profits is, is of course a bit larger, well, substantially larger, but you see that there's a significant component could be related to things going on like here. Finally, politics. So here the question really is that I'm asking, you know, how should I think about how the monetary system, either of those two different polar systems, shapes central bank profits? And what does this imply for the political support? And note, I don't have crisis here. There's no bank runs or anything of that sort in the model. There's no real bank crisis. So if you are in the CBDC world and you follow the Friedman rule, then we saw before that the optimal policy says you should set the spread equal to the resource costs of having CBDC circulating. That means the central bank basically makes zero profits. But if you're in the two-tiered system and you have deposits and reserves, and again, you follow the optimal policy rule, then it turns out that you will always have negative profits from doing so because you have to correct these two distortions, the externality that you wanna address by raising rates on reserves and this theta instrument to correct for the market power. And the two together will always give rise to negative profits whatever the theta is, whether it's positive or negative. And what I'm speculating then, it's really speculation in the paper, there's no political economy aspects in the model, is that if you're sort of indifferent between CBDC and the two-tiered system, that might give rise to political support for CBDC, simply because you need net less taxpayer support, less taxpayer money in the system. So if you have some distortions that would reduce tax distortions in the system, you have less of redistribution to bankers, which looks a bit like redistribution to bankers if you do the optimal policy. And you might also argue that this sort of strengthens central bank independence if you have less dependence or interaction with the treasury or with the tax collections from the outside. Okay, so this is a model of, on the one hand, a two-tiered system, on the other, on the one-tiered system or the combination of the two. Um, the optimal system is really determined by the resource costs and um, the implementation relies heavily on Friedman rules or modified Friedman rules. You might tax deposits or not under the optimal policy. It really depends on the size of these two distortions. Uh, under one condition about um, resource costs, there is a macro equivalence result and uh, from a political economy perspective, you might expect some support for a uh, CBDC system. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dirk. That was a, a great presentation of a very nice paper. Uh, you've put down, you've quantified what some of us have been speaking about in a, in a, in a way that uh, adds a lot of depth to the discussion. Uh, you've also managed to end exactly on time what else would you expect from somebody speaking from the heart of Switzerland? Uh, I, I won't say anything about Swiss versus Italian habits uh, in keeping to time because we do have uh, David uh, speaking from the US, uh, although, although with uh, background from Italy. So let's go to David, 10 minutes. Yeah. And um, then we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you are on the panel, which means if you have your video on, uh, just raise your hand and I'll turn to you to ask the question directly. And I'll also take questions from the Q&A and the chat. Apparently the Q&A is not working very well, so I can also take questions from the chat directly. So feel free to add your questions there. Uh, so David, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thanks very much. All right, let's see if this... Yeah, and I'll probably go over in keeping with my heritage. Let's see. First of all, uh, can everybody see this? Is this okay? Control L, I guess. There you go. Come so is that okay? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much to the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper by Dirk. Uh, it was a lot of fun to read. I learned a few things uh, from it. Uh, Dirk's broadly interested in, in um, I would say, uh, studying optimal monetary policy, optimal monetary systems. He does so, as he explained, in the context of a, a neoclassical growth model. It's kind of been appended to permit uh, kind of a liquidity demands, uh, say, emanating from the household sector, uh, households value liquidity, both uh, in the form of deposits and currency, so both private and public forms of, uh, of currency. Uh, there's a banking sector where banks value reserves uh, potentially to produce the, the deposits. Uh, 
Um, the firms in the in the model do not value liquidity, kind of interestingly, although I, I, I ask myself why not. Uh, and indeed, Dirt does mention this in a footnote. It might be interesting to extend the model in that di direction, given uh, the, the, the assumed liquidity demand coming from other sectors of the economy. Why not also the firm sector? And importantly, uh, banks are modeled as uh, local monopolists, which I, I like. So in terms of the structure of liquidity, uh, supply and demand, I mean, as Dirk mentioned, um, demand is, is generated really kind of in a reduced form a manner. It's money in the utility function for households. Uh, reserves kind of modeled as an input uh, in the production of deposits for banks. Uh, there's these uh, cost functions for, for producing liquidity. There's a unit cost of issuing deposits for banks that's assumed to be decreasing in uh, the uh, bank's own reserve to deposit ratio, but not only that, potentially also uh, unit costs of producing deposits are assumed to be uh, uh, potentially a function of the aggregate reserve to deposit ratio. So this implies the existence of an externality. Um, banks in the model may not want to hold a socially desirable level of reserves. Um, and as for the government, the government also faces unit costs of issuing uh, its, its liquidity, both in the form of a currency and also reserves. These are parameters. Uh, these unit costs are potentially stochastic, um, um, but although I don't, I don't think it's a terribly important for the analysis, but, but there does model it in a general form like that. Now, uh, so, some people have asked the question, what's the difference? Uh, I noticed in the Q&A, people asking, what's the difference between CBDC and uh, physical currency in the model? And the answer is, as, as Dirk actually alluded to, there, there really is no difference. There literally is no difference in, in the model. Uh, there's a, there's a, a policy can be used to support a real rate of return on, on, on currency. Uh, and, and the same is true if we reinterpret it, this to be CBDC. Okay. Uh, so uh, we can we can take a look at the optimal allocation here to serve as a benchmark. The, the planner in, in, in this um, um, setup needs to respect the demand for liquidity and the resource cost of creating liquidity. Um, now, you know, kind of as a person who's kind of worked for many years and kind of micro foundations, you know, I kind of ask, you know, should, should a planning solution uh, involve money in it, especially since money is, you know, the way uh, we typically view money as, a, as an exchange medium. It's not something that we, we think of people valuing intrinsically. Uh, and the answer is, well, probably not, but I don't wanna be uh, dogmatic about it. I mean, because whether, whether the micro foundations of money demand matter here likely depends on the set of questions being addressed. And I think that maybe some of the basic uh, results that uh, uh, Dirk has, has derived are probably not sensitive to the specific micro foundations, although ultimately one would have to check, of course. But in, in the model, it's generally going to be optimal for reserves, currency, deposits to coexist, uh, you know, in a most general specification um, at the optimal. And the planner is just going to adjust the quantities to equate the marginal social costs and benefits of all these objects, just as treating money just in the same way as it would treat uh, any normal good. I'm going to focus on uh, a, a, just a section of, of Dirk's paper because it's the part that interested me the most as a policy advisor. I'm going to focus on the Ramsey planner and because that's just, a, I only have time really to focus on this part. Um, so Dirk, Dirk considers a, a, a few scenarios. One, one scenario is he's, he's in a region of the parameter space where say currency dominates deposits. So suppose banking is just very expensive and deposit issuance is very expensive. And so you basically have this physical currency or the central bank digital currency that's the, uh, the source of uh, liquidity. And, and, and what you get here is kind of a, just a standard kind of like Friedman rule results. Uh, so that's kind of comforting, I think. Uh, it's kind of like a generalized Friedman rule because uh, Dirk explicitly assumes that there's a cost to issuing or maintaining this currency system. And to the extent that there is a cost, you may not, you're not going to be able to kind of uh, get the full Friedman rule, but it's basically the same idea. You want to kind of subsidize the real rate of return on currency and satiate the economy of liquidity as, as much as it's, it's possible up to the costs of actually uh, managing this monetary system. 
At, a, at another region in the parameter space, say when, when currency issuance is assumed to be very difficult, it's very cumbersome or for some reason, it's, it's just not, uh, it's just costly. And, and, and the banking system is the relatively more efficient way to provide a society with the uh, liquidity needs. And in that region of the parameter space becomes a little more interesting because the banks here are modeled kind of in, in an interesting way, right? We have uh, two, two types of distortions coming from the banking sector to contend with here. First is the, the monopoly distortion um, because these, these banks, the, they, they all are, are viewed as local monopolies. And then there's this externality issue, right? That the costs of the unit cost that for the bank for producing reserves is assumed potentially to depend on the aggregate reserve to deposit ratio. Now, if the Ramsey planner had a single instrument, say interest on reserves, it, you know, uh, the planner would try to, to adjust that instrument uh, as best as he or she could, but you're not going to go all the way given you have multiple distortions. It's kind of interesting that in this environment, as Dirk uh, describes, it, it would be um, introducing uh, the currency at this point as a second instrument would be interesting. Even if currency issuance is relatively inefficient, it could potentially be used to, to improve the allocation because by issuing a competing currency, you, you can kind of whittle away at the monopoly power that the banks have. Of course, this comes out as a social cost because by assumption, currency issuance is a relatively expensive way of providing liquidity. So there's a bit of a trade-off that uh, is kind of interesting to examine. Um, but what what Dirk does is introduce uh, another instrument that's assumed to be costless to, to operate, which is the deposit subsidy. So the interest on reserves and the deposit uh, subsidy, if, 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 if uh, calibrated correctly, can restore efficiency. Now, in the very general kind of environment, kind of with the nonlinearities that Dirk explained um, in, the, in the production of um, liquidity services, generally, you're going to have currency and deposits coexisting at the optimum. And in this case, um, the analysis shows how you can use all the available interest, in, instruments, interest on reserves, interest on currency, the deposit subsidy. Of course, you have this lump sum tax floating around in the background. It could, these can all be used to implement the optimal allocation. Kind of, he alludes to a, an interesting result uh, that it's generally not going to be optimal to equate interest on reserves uh, and interest on currency in this setup. And, and I, I didn't have time actually to dig deeply to see what the, was driving this result. I, I think it's because the potentially these two um, liquidity forms have different costs of production. But I'll let, I'll let Dirk uh, kind of elaborate on that point in his comments or re reply. And, and then the result is, of course, that the optimum uh, policy, you know, the interest on reserves, the interest on currency, the subsidy, they all should react to, to the state of the economy. All the, and, in the, and in the model, these are modeled as shocks to the money cost production function. These are the shocks that are modeled explicitly. So the cost of producing deposits, the cost of issuing currency, all of these things are, are potentially uh, uh, fluctuating stochastically and optimal policy should react to these. Now, um, I like the section on policy rules, and this is the part I'm going to focus on, uh, again, because I'm a policy advisor, I like this part. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he considers only the, the deposit-only case, I, I, at least in the body of the paper. But what, what you get in, in, the, in this case, as he demonstrates, is an optimal deposit subsidy and an interest rate rule that kind of depends on, on, on the deposit cost and reserve cost parameters. So, for example, as I've written there, uh, the interest on reserves is going to be some function of what you might call the uh, natural rate of interest or the RF in his, in his notation, multiplied by uh, the expression in square brackets, which, which consist of parameters, potentially time varying, potentially stochastic, that reflect the, uh, the, the, the cost of supplying reserves, that's rho, and the cost of producing deposits, that's the phi 1 and phi 2. So phi 1 represents uh, kind of the sensitivity of unit cost to the bank's own reserve to deposit ratio. Phi two represents the sensitivity of the unit cost to the aggregate reserve to deposit ratio. So phi two is a parameter that indexes the degree of the externality in the production of deposits. I take a look at, at this expression, you know, and I think, okay, um, Fair enough. Um, I mean, kind of thing. I wonder how big rho the cost of producing uh, reserves is in reality. Uh, I kind of I'm, I'm led to, to question the empirical relevance of the size of the externality, uh, the phi two there. 
Uh, and kind of what I have in mind here is that, I mean, unless I'm thinking about things different in the wrong way, I mean, if I think about the, an optimal central bank policy, I mean, to me, in, a, in an optimal central bank uh, managing the payment system would include a system where the central bank was stood ready to provide intraday credit uh, to banks, kind of the way it, uh, the Fed did pre-2008, right? Uh, there, there were tremendous volumes of intra, intraday credit being extended to banks to, to help facilitate uh, payments um, to the banks. And um, potentially banks don't have to carry very many reserves overnight at all, kind of as was the case in Canada, for example, until just recently. Now, if that's the case, so, um, I, you know, I, I don't know what, what role is this Phi 2 playing? Is this, uh, I, I don't really, that, that externality in the production of deposits kind of doesn't really resonate uh, with me. And so uh, maybe Dirk might like want to like rebut that part. Um, that David, like if you to... can try to wrap up uh, in the next uh, minute or so, that would be great. Thanks. I told you I was going to go over. This should have been a rational expectation. But <laughs> I will wrap up here. Yeah. So um, I would have liked to see the, the uh, case with coexistence and with specific application to CBDC. Um, and because uh, I think it's an, it, this is a setup that I think can deliver a very interesting uh, answer to the, the uh, pertinent policy question, which is if, if, if we do introduce a CBDC, kind of what should it be its rate of return? Not necessarily how should it vary over time in, in response to cost checks, but what are the principles that would govern whether or not a CBDC should earn a higher rate of return, say that interest on reserves? I think Dirks provides a very nice framework to kind of provide a way to for us to kind of think about that question. And I'd like to see the answer to that question both with and without an optimal deposit subsidy because it's not immediately clear that a, an optimal deposit sub subsidy is something say a central bank can uh, count on say if it depends say on legislation. Okay, let me wrap up. I think that, um, you know, modeling bank, mark bank power, I think is important. I think uh, it's really interesting in general to see how the principles of optimal interest rate policy kind of uh, might change in the context of uh, 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 an environment where banks have market power. I think this is kind of very relevant. Uh, um, I question kind of the resource cost of issuing deposit liabilities, say, as opposed to non-deposit liabilities. Are these significant? Are the resource costs of using reserves significant? And this deposit externality I've alluded to. Some, some empirical justification here, I think, would be welcome. Um, and I think that the, to the extent that much of the analysis, especially early on, uh, on the policy rules is qualitative, I think the analysis could have been much, made much simpler and without loss of generality, just by, by simplifying, assuming linear utility and consumption, for example, fixing the labor point input and doing away with the aggregate shocks. I mean, at the end of the day, the principles of, 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 of interest rate or policy setting is gonna be driven by the technology, money in the utility function, the cost of producing money, et cetera. Um, and maybe bring back the more general uh, framework for a quantitative exercise, I don't know. But overall, really, really a nice contribution. I think I enjoyed uh, reading it and I look forward to uh, the finished product. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was a, a very nice, very useful and constructive uh, discussion. Uh, Dirk, why don't we hear from you if you wanna take three minutes or so to respond to David and then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, so while you speak, hopefully others will think about the questions they wanna to pose to you. Well, David, thanks so much. Thanks very much. A great discussion, and I, I hope I get I can ask for your slides. I, I knew I was safe on the market power assumption, given that you have made the same assumption before. I was um, I'm actually pleasantly surprised of how easy you let me get off the hook, so to speak, given my money and utility function. Given your background, I expected much more pain in that respect, but you but you seem to be fine with that one. So that's. I basically agree on whatever you said. Um, uh, firms could have liquidity demand. I don't think it would change much. Again, given that I have this black box that generates money demand, it would be just more money demand and um, not much difference from there. Um, um, I think the thing that I definitely should do and which I have been thinking about, but I have sort of deferred it for now is let's forget about the theta instrument and let's see how good you can, um, you know, respond to developments with just um, the rate of reserves and still introducing cash, although cash is maybe not a very efficient means of payment. Uh, so how far, 
in terms of second best analysis, how, how far can you go? So that's um, something I, I, I should definitely look more closely into it. What you said about um, the difference between the, the first best uh, rate on return on uh, uh, public money versus um, reserves, uh, you're absolutely right. Your interpretation is the correct one. That hinges on the, on the resource costs in the background. So I think that is my interpretation as well. And how, how important are you know, these costs in, 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 in reality? Now, um, if you say they are basically zero at the margin, that will be fine given the policy rule that you showed. Essentially, you would, um, you would say that the interest rate on reserves should basically be the benchmark interest rate in that case. Um, that's fine. Um, basically, I'm not married to any particular assumption. I think it's important to have that in mind that payment systems and monetary systems create some resource costs and that the equivalence result depends on that. I mean, if you, if you don't meet that particular condition that I showed, then the equivalence is impossible to generate for obvious reasons, right? I mean, if it's more, more it requires more resources to generate liquidity in world A, then in world B, then you can never hope to get equivalence. That's, that's sort of obvious. And that's why I want to have it there. But um, yeah, other than that, I, I fully agree with whatever you said, and I hope that I can um, get access to your slides. Thank you very much, David. Thanks very much, Dirk, and thanks again, David, for the discussion. Uh, why don't we open it up for uh, questions? Uh, let's see if there are any questions among the panelists. So those of you who have their video on, you can uh, raise your hand and unmute yourselves to ask the question directly. So, Katrin. Yeah, Dirk, thank you for, for the presentation. And I was struggling a little bit with your argument that um, there would be political support for um, introducing CBDC because while well, following the discussion, I don't see a lot of this support. And I think it hinges on your assumption that there is a subsidy that is paid to banks. So um, what are you thinking of in terms of this subsidy and practice? So I see it from your model and I can see how you come to the conclusion that there is political support for stopping the subsidy. But in practice, do you think that's kind of that um, politics allow banks to have this uh, market power or um, so, so there are at least not physical transfers to banks huh, in, in practice. So, so I was wondering what you have in mind with the subsidy. Yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't observe exactly that instrument. You're perfectly right, Katrin, right? I mean, you might argue that there's sort of more uh, hidden implicit things going on. I think the, 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 the general feature here is the way I want to think about this is that if you believe that there are some distortions in the banking sector, and if you believe that you use some instruments, and these are typically fiscal instruments to correct them, then in the end, this will have fiscal implications, negative fiscal implications. Now, I think it's natural to believe, at least if you have this Ramsey perspective on the economy, that if the central bank provides means of payment, there is no natural way, or it's, not, it's less natural for me to think that there should be these kind of distortions. So there's no need to use these kind of instruments to correct any decisions because the central bank directly takes the decision itself, right? So in that sense, I think beyond these particular distortions I look at here, I would think it's natural to assume that there are some distortions in the banking sector, but fewer or maybe none in the central bank providing means of payment. And if there are some distortions in the private sector that you wanna correct, there will be some fiscal costs attached to them. Now, will it be exactly those instruments that you use to address those frictions or some other ones? I don't think it really matters in the end, it will generate some fiscal costs. That's the, that's the picture, I think. Are you thinking of financial inclusion issues in that respect? Is that something that could be at the heart of that? No, I don't. So. No, uh, I was I was, I was thinking, I mean, I'm not sure about what you have in mind financial inclusion, if it's just about, you know, making... I, I was thinking about the subsidy that maybe maybe paid to banks to offer services also to people they wouldn't probably want to offer uh, simply yeah. from. But then the first best would in that world, it would be to, to make payments to the financially excluded directly in the first place, right, and let banks set their prices as it's optimal to do, I guess. Um, I don't know, whatever distortion you have in mind. I, don't, I, I haven't thought about financial inclusion really carefully. There I would think you just give money to the poor people and then they should buy the bank services that they need. 
Okay, thanks. Let's go to Cyril. You have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tomaso. Uh, so this is more like a comment than a question. And it's about the fact that when we think about CBDC, we think that CBDC has to be provided by the government or the central bank. But as we know from Tomaso's work, you know, you could have the same result by providing a synthetic CBDC where, you know, that is very close to a narrow bank. Now, a narrow bank is a market provision of CBDC. It's a market driven, it's a market initiative, CBDC. And these initiatives, uh, they actually exist. So we know TNB in the US, the narrow bank, TNB, uh, has been put on the, on the map. Uh, by people we know, uh, you know, people from previous central bankers, uh, but uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of hurdles that has been put uh, to this operation, to this market initiative, which goes into the politics of it, right? So, because the the hurdle, so basically, I don't understand why the government would put uh, the brakes to a market initiative. I understand why the market would put break to a government-driven initiative, uh, but not to a market. No. So I, I wanted to hear the views of Dave and Dirk on that, uh, and maybe Tommaso as well. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, so, Cyril, uh, you were breaking up. I, I couldn't hear what you were I saying. I couldn't hear everything in the end, <laughs> neither, yeah. I, I've... Did you understand everything, Tommaso? Didn't catch everything, uh, but I think uh, Dirk was asking about the different models of providing uh, CBDC, including the model by which uh, the, the narrow bank or synthetic CBDC model and how that compared uh, to your paper. You seem to make a distinction, it's either or. Uh, I think Cyril was saying, well, but um, can't it be done? Uh, can't, isn't there a third way to do this? Um, so what do you think, Dirk? Well, I mean, you can think of the narrow bank here as a bank that is fully invested in reserves, right? Um, now, and there with this assumption about resource costs, I, uh, you as a specialist in the topic as a synthetic CBDC would have to help me because I mean, one way would be to say, well, in that world, you have the central bank issuing reserves and there's some costs attached to that. And then the commercial bank is basically transforming that one-to-one -one into this means of payment, this, uh, this synthetic CBDC. And again, there's probably some balance sheet cost or whatever associated with that one. If this is the way to think about synthetic CBDC, then synthetic CBDC would be different from the real thing, right? Because there you have just one balance sheet involved. And if the cost is sort of related to balance sheet positions, then you don't want to you want to have as short pos uh, balance sheet positions as possible. Maybe another perspective would be, you know, I mean, the central bank in that case uh, doesn't have any costs, right? It's really just uh, the guy that interacts with the, with the household in the end that bears some resource costs in operating that system. And then in the end, it wouldn't make much of a difference whether you have this intermediate layer or not. So, um, uh, yeah, I guess I, I, I don't know enough about banks and the real world to give an answer about this cost. It comes back to David's question, I guess, you know, what are these costs really? I mean, do we have a sense of how big they are? Uh, are they existent at all? And it really depends on that. In the model, it's just a parameter. And with the parameter, it would make a difference. But I don't know about the real world, really, um, since we don't observe these synthetic CBDCs, really, as, at this point. Thanks very much, uh, Dirk, for those thoughts. I think it's about costs. It's about it's about benefits as well. The idea when you have these liquidity benefits and you know potentially uh, having more variety um, and uh, having types of money that are more uh, targeted towards specific uh, use cases may bring uh, uh, welfare uh, to the system. Uh, so let's see. Let's go to Umberto. Hey, hi. Um so, Dirk, how, I was interested in um, part of your presentation. You talked about the CBDC replacing deposits, um, and then the bank, the central bank, kind of funding banks. And I'm a little concerned about, um, you know, it's like banks don't 
just get the uh, are funded not just with deposits and in general it just feels to me like somebody is going to still need to do a lot of what you know we call monitoring um and it's sort of like it feels like it's too much trust on our ability or the ability of the government to properly monitor you know so i don't know but it's sort of like i think in some sense because we're not moni we're not modeling monitoring we get these stark stark results and then yeah anyway it's just a comment i guess yeah i mean you're absolutely right i mean um this is an equivalence result like any equivalence result it's supposed to give a benchmark to think what matters but it's clearly not the real world right i mean banks banks balance sheets are are complicated that's not the issue the issue is that in the real world there are connections between the liabilities and the assets on the bank's balance sheet at least that's what many people would argue and what a big literature would argue now if you talk about monitoring as the monitoring that banks do relative to the loans that they extend, that would not be an issue in the model, right? Because the banks still invest in capital as they did before. That's not the no, issue. No, I get that. But, but the issue know, is the monitoring yeah. of the of the central of the commercial bank funding, right? Yeah, right. I mean, you, and, you, you're replacing all of the... Yes. You know, and it's sort of like, um, we do a lot of, you know, monitoring of banks, but... Yes, yeah. Uh, but, if, but if you say we, then I have a bit of, I mean, if you talk about we being the depositors, then I have my doubts. No, no, I mean, I mean, the central bank does a lot of monitoring of banks. And it but, will still do it, right? It's still. Yeah, works. yeah. But I mean, I think that doesn't mean, um, you know, that it would sort of be um, equally effective than if it shares that monitoring with the private sector or or if it, or how costly that would be and how and you know how much can the government mess up the things you know if if we just leave it to the government to monitor bank activity well if if it's just about the monitoring then i would argue the central bank and the financial market authorities these days they do most of that and they could still do exactly the same amount in this new world right and if you take the equivalence as the benchmark, you could actually argue that in this new world, um, the central bank would be doing better, right? Because in the current world, in spite of all these monitoring, there is the, there's, there's externalities, there's run externalities among all these small depositors, which is not modeled in the paper at all. But in the new world, you would have this large creditor, this guy who could in principle replicate what all these small depositors do, but presumably this large guy could actually do much better, right? Because this is a large guy that internalizes these kind of run externalities. So you might think the central bank would actually be able to do better than just generating the equivalent result, no? Maybe. But what I wanted to say before, there's many reasons to argue that the equivalence does not go through in the banking sector because a large literature argues that the bank liabilities are tied to the bank assets. There are some, there are some synergies between the two, right? Um, Kashyap uh, Stein and Rajan Kashyap Stein would argue that um, deposits are useful, that, that it's not just the funding that matters, but there are synergies in some sense between the liability side and the asset side. And here those synergies could potentially break down or could disappear because now it's a completely different type of liability, which is in the balance sheet of the, of the commercial bank. And obviously you would also question whether the, whether the central bank would extend the loan um, against no collateral, right? That's another reason why you might say central banks would never do that. Uh, Derek, thanks very much. Why don't we take a similar question from the Q&A from Oscar Soons? who asks, does the central bank take on credit risk by compensating the banks for deposit outflows? Well, in, in the equivalent arrangement, the loan is extended against no collateral. So every central banker I ever talked to in my life just laughed at me when I told them about this, this thing, right? Because they said it's completely unrealistic. But then I guess you have to ask you in what world are we currently living? In the current world, 
we um, depositors, we fund the banks against no deposits, uh, against no collateral, right? When we, when we hold deposits at the, at the commercial bank. And we do this because we trust that in the end, there's this big land of last resort in the background that will make sure that in the end, we essentially hold real dollars and not just Citibank dollars, right? On our account. So if that is the world, if the real world is really one of a big land of last resort that is committed at least in most of states of the world to, to provide this assistance, then the equivalent arrangement really would not call for collateral on the, CB, on the, on the refunding by, uh, of city by the Fed system. Otherwise, and we live in a schizophrenic world, right? Now, I don't, I'm not sure in which world we live, but if we live in a world in which the land of last resort is there and is actually committed to interact, then the equivalent arrangement should not ask for collateral. Thanks very I much. A, I had a question or a comment on, on, on related to this as well. Uh, Dirk, I was surprised that you didn't uh, push back against what David said a little bit more uh, when he was questioning the size of those um, uh, of, of those costs, because it seems to me that the, uh, the although we can question the size of the cost directly, the externality cost has to be of significance in this story. The uh, you don't you don't model it, of course, but the but the but the notion that uh, my ability and the dangers of, of the needs for, for for reserves are going to be greatly dependent upon how much the rest of the uh, economy what the rest of the banking system is doing seems like it ought to be a fundamental part of the story. And so, um, prima facie, that ought to be an important uh, an important cost to think about. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, you know much better about this than I do. And um, if you have a reference that I could even use to sort of, you know, strengthen that case, I would be very, very glad. Thank you. But my, my point, though, Chuck, is I mean, that would surely depend on how the central bank is set up to deal as a lender of last resort, I mean, or to, to facilitate intraday credit. Um, and we've... <laughs> If, if, if a central bank stands ready to facilitate the interbank credit, why, why should me as an individual bank care about what the aggregate reserves are out there? That's kind of my point, so. Let's see if anybody else wants to come in. Feel free to unmute yourselves and ask the question. I don't see any hands up. Um, Cyril came back with a clarification or I guess an open question. Um, I, and while he was speaking, he directed the question also to Dave. I don't know if you want to take this, Dave. Is why do regulators not like the notion of a narrow bank uh, holding reserves uh, as assets and issuing payment liabilities? What's, what's wrong with that, asks Cyril. Dirk, do you want to have a go? David, move first. Uh, well, first of all, I, I don't know if that's even true. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm not, I'd have to speak to the regulators. I don't know what the issues there. Uh, regulators, I guess, just naturally very conservative and cautious. I, and I, I don't have any details as to what the attitudes were in terms of the narrow bank specifically. Uh, maybe Antoine. I'm going to nominate Antoine, who was much closer to the action. The Alpine. Uh, take it away. <laughs> I think the only thing I can say is that um, there has been no decision made on, uh, on, on whether to grant an account at TNB. And uh, I, I believe a lawsuit that TNB brought was dismissed uh, on, on the grounds that um, no decision had been made. My reading from the outside, not being part of the Fed system whatsoever, was that I think there's this usual sort of fear uh, that you know whatever might um, lead to deposit outflows is something which is dangerous, right? And of course, typically central banks don't view that there might be an alternative way of funding banks. They certainly don't like that idea. So to me, it sounds very natural that you want to avoid everything that could lead to an outflow of deposits from the banking sector. Well, then what explains the existence of government money funds then? I mean... Well, that's at least, yeah, yeah. And as you said, there's other ways for banks to, uh, actually they could 
as I, as I said in my paper, I mean, the response would be for banks to compete more vigorously for the deposits to retain them. I mean, there's, that's yeah. also an option, so. But that's a pretty sophisticated argument, no? I think. <laughs> Competition. <laughs> Competition to keep your deposits and service your clients, uh, you know, to make them happier. Um, I, don't, I don't think that's, that's that sophisticated, but. Uh, and then, of course, the central bank's going to stand ready to, to manage any disruptions in, in payments flows. Again, as long as the Fed stands ready to, to provide liquidity on demand. Uh, I don't, I, these, these, these uh, stories of financial instability, uh, deposit flows, uh, leaving the banking sector, I think are greatly exaggerated. Uh, and honestly, I think it's because uh, banks just don't want to face the competition. I understand that part. I, I tend to agree with you, David. We have one last question, I think, that just came in uh, from Scott. Is that right? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I enjoyed. I don't see it. Do you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask both Dirk and, and David to uh, kind of weigh in on this. And I apologize. It's the it's a question about the black box that you didn't really want to talk much about. But I've spent much of uh, the second half of my career trying to figure out uh, consumer payment choices and use of different assets for, um, for, for medium of exchange. So I'm wondering, <clears throat> I, I still don't understand as I think through this, how, how the, the, the central bank digital currency is going to provide a superior product in terms of deposit services to the deposits that private banks currently um, currently provide. So I've heard a lot of bankers say, uh, you know, with regard to we need faster payments or we need uh, digital payments, they always say we have that. It's, a, it's called the debit card. Um, and I see that your analysis of the household side relies heavily on potential differences in the rates of return to CBDC versus a deposit account. But there's a whole nother side of that, which is the payment networks and payment networks inherently uh, have increasing returns to them. And I'm just wondering if you, if either of you think much about like how, how practically would the CBDC provide payment services? They, they, do they have to get terminals in every store? Do they, do they join a, uh, you know, a, a debit card network or, and, and how would they be able to do that better? And is, isn't that duplicating services that, that are already provided by a single network already? Well, I mean, uh, I'll take that. I mean, in principle, I mean, I'm not in the weeds, you know, in the kind of how these things actually work it down in the uh, nitty gritty, but conceptually, the way I think about it is, if we could design a payment system from scratch, and indeed in a model, like how would you design it? I know how I'd design it. I'd have a central ledger where everybody had an account and could just directly debit and credit accounts on this central ledger directly without any, any middleman. And that's like a CBDC, universally accessible by, uh, by all. You just have a card and, and, and everybody just pays uh, with money in their central bank account. Uh, the present system, of course, is, has evolved over time as with technologies, institutional arrangements. It's, it's this interconnected network you have uh, you know, the middlemen are there. What role are they playing? Obviously they play an important role in history. Do they still play an important role given the technologies that we have available? I just think it's probably intrinsically more complicated to make a payment if you have to go through several banks, you know, correspondent banking issues and stuff like that. That conceptually just have one single central ledger to handle basic payments, just at least at a conceptual level seems to make sense to me. That's how I think about it, Scott. But so I see that I, I, I sort of agree with what David said. Yeah. On the on the other hand, when I when I talk to people in in, in Zurich in bankers, nobody of them would answer. You know that they would ask for or would hope for higher efficiency on the on the on the retail level for payments from CBDC than what they currently have. What they are emphasizing is that some of their customers would like to have that store of value right available to have a bit more safety maybe for some of their assets in investments. But I, th but I think from the macro point, really where I'm coming from, from the macro perspective, there um, I see a big plus in CBDC um, that it would help reduce some too big to fail problems and thereby um, lower the need for regulation because there's a huge 
um, time inconsistency issue that could potentially be uh, moderated or resolved by having people use public money rather than private money. And I see the competition argument that, that David has emphasized, right? I mean, uh, there's reasons to expect that could help. I don't think uh, talking to people who are really into payments and in the nitty gritty of that, they tell me that this cross-border transactions inefficiency that many people emphasize, I don't think that's a big deal in terms of technology that could be improved there. It's rather, again, competition and regulation that seems to be the, the, main, uh, the main problem to be solved. And, and CBDC per se is probably not that the, the root of the problem problem or the absence of CBDC, it's competition and regulation that is that is potentially uh, prohibiting better solutions, my understanding, but yeah, second-hand so, information. So just one quick follow-up, if the CBDC payment provision is dominant, um, would it not in the long run is eventually uh, push out the private deposits at banks? And if so, then where do they get funds, loanable funds? Well, according to the model, there would be, ref I mean, if you want the banks to, to, to stay in place, then the central bank would refinance them. That's what the model says. So you could keep the banks in existence by simply refunding them through the central bank system. Maybe you don't even want that, right? Who knows? I think an, another and maybe more, in my view, more dangerous question or, or issue would be if you have this cool CBDC around um, what would happen to the demand for cash, actually. Would people lose interest in cash? And there are some interesting papers on that, right? Where people try to model that once the CBDC is available, why should I still demand cash? And I think uh, it's quite useful. I mean, but that's a that's a personal uh, opinion. It's quite useful to have cash as a as a insurance device and also to keep some government uh, interventions in check. But if the political support for cash would weaken as a consequence of CBDC, I would consider that as a potential disadvantage of CBDC. Okay, thanks very, very much uh, for that uh, discussion. Perhaps one last thought is, uh, um, you know, Dirk, you're talking about a very cool uh, CBDC and, and it may be very cool, but it, it may not also. I mean, there is a risk in, uh, in, in David's world where you have this one, one payment system, the CBDC one, that in a world where technology is evolving very rapidly, there is a risk that the central bank or whatever institution is putting out that currency is not going to keep up with the uh, evolution of technology and may not offer a product that uh, fits everyone's needs. There is a love of variety. There is a heterogeneity among users. And that at some point, maybe you'll start to have private payment companies that will take your CBDC uh, from you that you no, lo no longer want to use so much and will issue a, uh, a better, in some way or another, a better uh, payment liability. And in a way, in a sense, by, by having introduced the CBDC, which you make available to all, you've allowed the possibility of having the private sector hold the CBDC uh, and issue a payment liability uh, without, without necessarily giving the private sector access to central bank accounts at, at the central bank, right? right? Without giving the private sector access to a to reserves, you, you give them access to CBDC like everybody else, and they can then turn around and issue uh, another type of payment uh, liability. Just an interesting thought to, to keep in mind. Uh, I thought this was a really interesting uh, paper, very uh, thought provoking, very deep, very nice discussion. Wonderful to see all these uh, familiar faces around the room. Congratulations to the organizers to have put this together. And I'll turn it back to Russell for some closing words then. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tommaso. So I, we hope to see you again next month on June 25th, which is usually the last Friday of the month where the New York Fed uh, will host the next session. So uh, we'll be moderated by Anton Martin. Michael Lee will present a paper monetizing privacy and Bruno Brias as we will discuss it. So have a good weekend. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hey, everyone. Thanks. See you.